William, before I come to you, I hope you, you accept that I just have a short question to Eric again in, in reflection of, of the, uh, his wonderful presentation. Um, for Herbert, when in, in later times, uh, he always, always said continuity, continuity is also a question of life. Life, in life, there is no um, ecke, so it's sharp edges. sharp edges. Life objects are continuous, and uh, that's the reason um, that continuity is so important. It, is, it, is, it builds forms, it builds life, animals, so object, not only objects, but also human beings, animals, plants, and so on. Um, do you have any reflection on that? You are a physicist, I know, so you are not a biologist. Uh, but do you have a short reflection on that? Because that go goes a bit further than the pure mathematical, physical um, discussion. Yes, it's, is this on? Can you hear me from the back? Yeah. It, yeah, it's very difficult to make a general statement because um, as I was suggesting in the talk, when we look at reality, it really depends at what scale we're looking at. And the, the macroscopic world where we, where we live, in fact, in, in that world, everything is smooth and continuous. As we go to the microscopic level, that's just not true anymore. We have actually discontinuous jumps as part of quantum mechanics, even at the level of chemical reactions, that things are quite discontinuous. So, but we are fixed in yes, reality, we are, we are in the so we cannot world. see. Herbert always wanted to open this world, of course, but uh, it's, it's close to the human when looking at it. So our life, uh, in our life, continuity is much more important, of course, than it is in reality when we are looking to the, phys the basic laws of, of the world. Yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, okay. I think that I was asking myself, so Herbert says that that this continuity is, a, say, a reason why we find certain things beautiful or not. And one can then ask, say, from the evolutionary point of view, where does that come from? Does it come from our search for water as primitive beings or something like that? And then one can ask, um, yeah, where does it come from for us as human beings um, as we had developed evolutionarily? And then, you know, probably something through, as you're saying, through um, um, the need for life, biophilia, as, as has been said, that we yeah, we, we need to search for water and food and so on, and in that case, continuity would, been, would have been playing a role. Yeah, and that's the reason that he thought continuity is also important for aesthetics, you know, because it's our world. So, I, w I want to stop. I, I would love to talk to you much more, um, but um, we will stop at this point, and I, I will say welcome to William again. So, William, uh, do you have a direct reflection to, to uh, the words? Otherwise, I would ask you to... Uh, to start with the question, how do you feel? How do, did you come to this world's art and science? How did you merge them in your person? Um, so, um, I guess what was very formative for me was uh, I went from the Royal College of Art, art School into the IBM UK Scientific Centre, which was a centre that deliberately brought people from different disciplines. So there was uh, molecular chemists, there was archaeologists, there, were, there was a surgeon who did the first visualization of a human heart beating. So I went into this renaissance situation and IBM would br deliberately bring in domain experts and then they developed this, these software libraries off the back of all this interaction. So that was extremely influential and set the tone for all everything that was to come. And so I'm still working with Stephen Todd who was with me then. Um, so that was very, very formative, this kind of renaissance idea. I guess what I did learn was um, always respect the domain expert, because if you're working on a project with science, they are the lead, and your role is to, to help deliver on that. But it, I guess one key thing is, is um, we were in the molecular, cellular space, with prote proteins being really fundamental in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you are, you are both artists and scientists. Would you agree uh, that uh, the analytic side of your art, of you yourself making art, is very important? So how do you um, reflect the situation that art is also a bit emotional, that it should be, be it should be beautiful? That's an emotion, not not an analytic 
aspect. How do you see these two parts um, between emotion and emotional intuition on one side and the analytic construction on the other side doing art? Uh, Eric? Yeah, so, so for me, although there is al always some analytical aspect to my art, the, the intuitive side is extremely important and, and, and very essential. So most of my projects, they work, I have some idea that requires implementation of some algorithm, a very technical analytical process, but I always try to get my codes to a point where I can turn off that analytical side, that I can use what I think of as a nonverbal part where I'm just then exploring the space of possibilities in an intuitive way and if the if the results don't feel right then i throw the whole thing in the trash so the the final result yes it has to be legibly intuitively and emotionally and the, the analytical side for me is kind of more at the earlier stages of, of creation so the, the concept yes yes and and william um gosh quite a, um i guess you know from an artistic point of view Aesthetics are really, really important. Um, and artistically, I'm very interested in that midpoint between chaos and order. Um, and people find that space really appealing. They, and you, to one way, uh, go one way, heading towards entropy, and the other is, is perfection. Um, the scientists, you know, like I've been working, did a lot of work with Professor Ryden Torek, University of York, who's working on viruses. And some viruses extremely elegant, like uh, COVID, influenza, but Ebola is just very, very ugly. So I guess you have to kind of, that, I think the problem is the scientists like, would like to find an elegant solution, but the complexity of the models is so huge uh, that, reala that realizing the AI is the only way we're gonna work out the solution. I think historically at school you're taught to create very elegant equations, but actually the problem is far more complex than humans can really conceive. Yeah, yeah. H how about you, uh, Eric, and your, your um, reflection on the question uh, chaos and uh, order? Um, this is a term that is also very well known in science, of course. So how do you see it as an artist uh, and, an sci and a scientist as well? Yeah, that's, that's in super, art, of course. That's super interesting because, in fact, this um, boundary between chaos and order, it, in fact, in many physical models of complex systems, is actually a phase transition between different phases, just like we have, say, a gas and a liquid phase of, an, of usual materials. In models of more complicated things like, like neural networks or the brain, in fact, there's a phase transition between a kind of subcritical phase and a supercritical phase. And, and what we find is that many natural systems, like the brain, are exactly at that that phase transition between chaos and order, which is super interesting. And as regards art, so some of my physics work is about um, models of languages, looking at the spaces of all possible languages and so on. And my first NFT project called Alien Tongues was interpreting that work geometrically. And what it was quite nice was that I, I, had a, I had a theoretical result for this phase transition between chaos and order. And I placed my the art series exactly on that point so that you had you could see the interplay of the two across the different mints of the series. So that was quite nice, and for me, um, yeah, a way to combine very explicitly uh, art and science. But, but just to ask you once again whether I understood correctly, did you say it was a, a mental decision to put it in between? So this is, this is an right. analytical yes. decision and yes. not an intuitive one. Yes, because uh, in fact we had, I had a theoretical result that the, the languages would have maximal complexity at this transition, in fact, um, in other things, like in the brain, that's also the conjectured reason why human brains sit at this phase transition. And so it was to get this maximal complexity that I put them, put them there. Um, and then, okay, I, I did that just analytically, but then of course the point is to see in whether the it's working, output, whether it's working yes. or not. Okay, that's that's a deal. <laughs> William, um, Eric, in his talk, he, talk, he, he mentioned um, CP Snow, I think. Yep. CP Snow has a, a bit of different um, um, interpretation of the two worlds because he, he mainly focused to the divide, to the gap between both. And Herbert uh, was mm. on the other side. He, he wanted to bring them together. So, so what is your reflection about that um, from your side? Yeah. 
and uh, where do you see this combination, or maybe not combination, between art and science, or art yeah. or science? So I guess, I guess CP, I was thinking about our panel today on the plane. Um, um, and you know, so CP Snow was writing in the 50s, 60s, when there was a very clear class, class structure in, in the UK. You had the workers and the upper classes. Um, and he was saying that the upper classes don't understand the science, you know, so there was this split. Um, uh, so, yes, yeah, so we don't quite have the same class structure. Um, but I, I have a slightly different view on it. It's, it's really, th it's like a triangle with three corners. You have science in one corner, art in one, the other corner, and then engineering, which in com includes, includes computer science, the left-hand corner. And the engineers are working uh, to create models, which hopefully the scientists will accept. So, yes, I think definitely the two cultures are science and art, but there's this other element, engineering, because the scientists are actually quite skeptical of the engineers as well. So, um, but yeah, so that's my variation on Herbert's basic mm -hmm. idea of the two cultures. So it's a triangle. A, tri a triangle. A triangle, yeah. and it's. Um, in every human, and uh, the the heavy, which is more heavy or less heavy, depends on the personal. Uh, yeah, I, I, on you know, the, the, the triangles are quite clear. Like art has no function; has to have no function at all. That's why you can't call craft art. Um, engineering is using pure maths. It's you know it's from first principles, and science has to be absolute. You know, and then. Medical stuff is off the back of science, but a lot of great science isn't finding its way into the medical world. So when we're working, I'm coming up from the art point of view, we're aligning with the engineering triangle, and then we work with the scientists. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a clear triangle, from my point of view. Um, do you think that you yourself, being on both sides, are different to either pure artists or pure scientists? So. Does it give any add-on um, to be an artist? Uh, how, how, how is your personal reflection? Would you think that artists should know more about science? Um, so I would like to hear your reflection about that. So say from the point of view of scientists, um, there's a bit of a spectrum across the sciences. I, I would say that the majority of mathematicians, for them, they're interest in mathematics is aesthetic. It's strictly aesthetic. Um, when it comes to physicists, then there, there are a few different types. Most theorists are also, their interest is really primarily driven by aesthetics, and there's some other phenotypes. Um, but the way to make a successful career in physics is not necessarily to pursue beautiful things. It's more to find what is the problem where I can make the contribution right now. And so there's some tension there in terms of how one actually makes a career as a, as a scientist. But I think the aesthetic point of view has certainly, certainly been helpful for me. And, and it's more like a motivating factor. I mean, the reason why I want to do physics is because there's underlying beauty there. And then as regards, say, the other side about coming from artists, I think one should have more of an open mind to science because the, 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 the ideas that come from science, say, for example, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, it's something that it's true and we would never have discovered it if not for the experiments because Okay, one can propose all kinds of things theoretically, but um, we're kind of limited by our everyday experience. But what we have learned, particularly from physics, from precision experiments, is that the world is far stranger than we can imagine. And we only got there by, by the slow process of, of science. And one can learn these ideas. They do have some intuitive understanding because although, say, with quantum mechanics, the most precise expression of, of the theory and the results is in some mathematics, there is an underlying intuitive picture that the, the practitioners use when they're trying to develop new theories. And I, I feel that that intuitive picture can be carried to people who don't necessarily know the math. Mm -hmm. Any reflection on that? Um, yes, yeah, so I guess as an artist, I'm in a peculiar position in that the form grow grammar that we've developed uh, already has close links with protein structures. So Mike's, Professor Mike Sternberg at Imperial College, head of the bioinformatics group, 
when we first met him, he said, oh, William, by the way, your, your forms just look like protein secondary structures, beta barrels, you know. You know uh, and then we got into the grammar, and he said, well, that's really interesting. There's commonality between the grammar, which is actually operating within the protein space, these long chains that coil round, and they've got bits off the side, very similar to your, in your artwork. So I guess the, right from the start, there was a close relationship with, with science, and that continued with the work with Oxford University. It was exactly... Mm -hmm. So with them, we've been working on protein folding, and then with Sternberg, it was protein docking, so we take our engine, all the mutator stuff, and adapt it for the scientific applications and then do some clever work and then pull it back into the art. So all the protein stuff uh, we're now using in the art again. It's this big circle. So the, the bridging is fulfilled al already in your work, so, and yes. in both of your works. So. Yep. So, <laughs> um, yep. you, you both mentioned mathematics, of course, because that's your basic language. Uh, hard science is working. and. Um, at the end of our talk, I would like to, to address uh, a, f more, a philosophic question to you. You both know that I will ask that. Um, probably in the audience, um, this question would, is, is maybe a little shock. Why do, do they talk about that at this uh, point here in, in, in our, at our community of, of um, generative art? Um, but I really would like to get your uh, f um, feedback um, about uh, the question, do you think that mathematics is, is a language like our speak, speaking language? So it's a language 2.0 that, um, that is created by man? Or is, uh, is it the underlying grammar of all our universe, of everything that is existing. So um, you had a bit time to think about that, so I would like to ask you to give some reflection about this subject uh, as a scientist and an artist. Who wants to begin? <laughs> so it, it, in mathematics what we do is we, we take some assumptions, we call them axioms, and then we use the process of deduction to, to deduce the consequences. And we're free to choose the axioms any way we want. So the mathematics that ends up being most useful to science are ones where the axioms match some part of the world as some approximation. And so, but since we're free to choose the axioms any way we want, then in fact, mathematicians often just choose totally crazy axioms just to see the consequences. So the, the relationship between mathematics and the world is a bit more subtle because it really depends on your starting point. And in fact, everything in mathematics is a tautology. Everything is automatically true once you make the axiom. So in fact, all of the, all of the, um, the substance is in a sense there in the axioms. It's just that we have to unpack it, and that unpacking is very difficult to do. So, yes, yeah, so it's a bit, uh, well, it's a bit tricky. <laughs> so now uh, the 20th question. century. <laughs> very hard question. Um, yeah, probably maths, like language, is a blunt instrument. Um, it probably gets us quite a long way, but the same way that we can't say certain things, maths probably can't reach particular domains. I, I'm not an expert. And you, I guess it does the job right now, and you know, all the software we're writing obviously is using maths heavily. You know, as soon as people were using trigonometry to navigate by the stars, for ships, you know, that's the foundations of maths, etc., which carried right the way through. Um, yeah, so I guess we just don't, we just, in our work, we just say, well, that's it. You know, we can't Eric, okay. deal with the clever stuff. Um, <laughs> you know, we just say, well, okay, well, this is what we've got. Let me better get on with it. Okay, so, so you are somehow on the, I cannot decide, I'm a scientist, so I don't talk, I don't, I don't have an opinion a final opinion about it for my personal life. Do I interpret you correct? Herbert was sure that um, there is a grammar underlying and we are detecting this. Um, this will, is the subject, by the way, for many of his science fiction novels, where he always said we need creativity and that's not, we can simulate something like creativity in machines, of course, but they cannot never be really creative because there is real chance in the universe. Uh, so um, maybe two, two words from your side if you want to reflect that. 
The universe is lawful, it follows the laws of physics, and those do take some mathematical expression. And I just make a distinction between that and pure mathematics, which is a more broader domain where we're not necessarily talking about describing the universe uh, as we see it. So th then the question is really whether the, the lawful universe, whether we can, in principle, understand it in, in all detail. And then, so w what has been said is that um, the, the reason why physics is mathematical is not because the universe is, is entirely mathematical, it's because it's only the mathematical properties that we are able to discover. So there's a distinction there between, say, like, path-dependent um, things that we will never be able to, to predict, but just to, to, just to, ex to experience, or versus um, the lawful parts, which are the ones, the regularities that we can describe by, by mathematics and physics. Okay. It's incredible. Big philosophical <laughs> question. Right. Um, right. Yeah, I guess I'm always fascinated that the, 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 you know, the way life, protein, the role of proteins is amazing. And you know, we've got these kind of chains, structures. Yeah, so I think, you know, it's, it's amazing, the, 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 that fundamental level. Um, but that's a massive question. I really can't mm -hmm. respond to that okay. effectively. So, so you see, uh, we, we have big stuff here in the morning after breakfast. It was very important for me to talk to these two wonderful people about that. And I think we are at the end. So thanks a lot. <laughs>